Okay, we're here at our last language video. We're going to talk about how language um, is seen and impacts the cultural landscape. Uh, go ahead and take a second to um, organize your notes uh, according to these key concepts. The first thing we're going to talk about is how do languages vary among places. Um, and we're going to talk about the national scale first and talk about um, official language. This is the language used by a government for all of its interactions. So I've got examples here of where an official language have, has to be used. Um, there are some positives and negatives to having an official language in your country. Um, some positives are that it creates unity in really diverse states. It's efficient and it helps people communicate. And it's also cheaper. Think about printing road signs in four different languages. That would um, get really expensive because the signs would be much larger uh, than what we're used to. Um, some negatives, though, is that the official language is usually the language of a powerful majority and so it oftentimes works to um, isolate or marginalize or endanger um, other languages. So you can see here um, I've got two maps uh, to show you where um, some official languages are distributed and so um, the top map is where English is distributed as an official language, and the bottom is um, where French is. And so there is a common theme here that previous colonies um, have adopted these languages as their official languages. Um, so for instance, Nigeria was an official colony, or I'm sorry, was a previous colony of Great Britain, and it has established English as its official language. Um, so same thing with France, um, places uh, such as uh, Rwanda, the Congo, um, and Mali have adopted uh, French as its official language as well. So there are some countries with multiple official languages. There can be more than one. Uh, places like Israel have Arabic and Hebrew as their official language. Canada has French and um, English. And the Netherlands and South Africa actually have multiple official languages. So another way to think about how languages vary among places is um, the standard language. Um, this standard language is a, usually the dialect of the upper class or the government of a country, which is why I have Queen Elizabeth here. Um, and it's usually um, disseminated um, through the government schools and the media. And so when you think standard language, you should think about high class dialect. When you think about official language, you should just think about like a simple, more broader idea of a language. So let's talk about a dialect. This is going down to a local scale. We talked about dialect a lot in class, so I just want to really mention two things. The first thing is these are the three original um, kind of American dialects, Northeastern, Midlands, and Southeastern. And distinct people were moving here um, during the colonial era, which contributed to these distinct dialects. So in the north are the Puritans. Um, in the mid-Atlantic, people such as Quakers, Scottish, Irish, and German migrants came to America. Um, and in the southeast, uh, we see a large population of indentured servants and slaves. And so these people, um, their cultures uh, contributed to distinct dialect formation. And we can see through this map how dialect has diffused across the United States. The second thing that I want to mention is why is American dialect um, different than Great Britain dialect, which you can see here. Um, and so there's two reasons here why American is, is different than British English. First of all, the isolation between the two countries. We are an ocean apart, and often um, and when you look back in history, communication was not easy between these two countries. And secondly, um, when the United States was established, the U.S. wanted to create a distinct national identity that was much different from their British uh, colonial oversight. So they um, worked to kind of establish their own culture, and one way to do that is through language. 
So an isogloss is like um it's like a a boundary that shows us where different dialects occur. And so um some examples of isoglosses are what do people in America um what word do you use to say soft drink? Uh so like in in Ohio we typically use pop. Um what word do you use to say gym shoes, right? So this map is funny because Chicago and us in Cincinnati are um, distinctly uh, singled out here because apparently we are the only people who say gym shoes, um, whereas uh, the majority of the U.S. says tennis shoes and then some people um, say sneakers. So there are tons of examples of these. I'm sure that you could think of them. How do you say a group of people? Um, how do you refer to your mother? What do you call the bathroom? Um, and so it, what the main idea here is that different dialects have different terms that refer to the same thing. And that's what an isogloss is. So let's talk about preserving language diversity. Um, so we're on the second topic now. Currently, there are about 5,000 to 7,000 world languages. And about one to two of those languages are being lost every two weeks. An extinct language is a language without any native speakers. And so, like, why are these languages being extinct or being put in danger? And the majority of this has to do with assimilation um, and globalization. So um, during the colonial period um, and even today, um, imperialism has really affected where language has been distributed throughout the world. And so natives or indigenous people that are colonized are oftentimes forced to use the language of that dominant power. Um, and then globalization is really impacting language because to achieve economic success in today's world, you have to adopt the language um, of either the, the capital of your country or the kind of global dominant language. And so we know that the majority, not the majority, I should say, about 50% of content that is published online is published in English. And so this really contributes to assimilating kind of all people of the world, at least people who access the internet, into using English. So um, the, the people that are most um, susceptible to having their languages um, be put in danger or become extinct are African and um, American tribal languages. And so when I say American tribal languages, I'm talking about all of the Americas, not just the United States. Um, and then African tribal languages. And um, just think about the loss of languages, the loss of culture and history and tradition. And so people are lo really losing their cultural identity um, as their languages become um, more and more endangered or extinct. So there are um, some organizations out there that are, that are trying to prevent the extinction of these languages. So even if a language becomes extinct, it can sometimes be revived, and Hebrew is an example of that. We know from our study about religion that Hebrew was um, the language that the Bible was written in, the Jewish Bible called the Torah, and by the 4th century BCE, that's pretty much the only place that it was used is in these religious services. However, if you fast forward to the end of World War II, um, the state of Israel was created for Jewish refugees of the Holocaust. And so, in an attempt to promote um, some sort of unifying Jewish culture, um, the leaders of the establishment of Israel decided to create um, an official language of Hebrew um, in Israel. Um, but remember, Israel also has Arabic as their official language. So this is one way that they attempted to unify themselves as one culture, even though they were coming from all different places, and revive Hebrew. Um, so there are isolated languages that are preserved um, in our world, um, and an example of that is... Um, the Basque language, which I'm not going to talk about because you read extensively about that in your 6.3 reading. Um, but what I do want to talk about is Icelandic. So first of all, an isolated language is a language without a family. 
And um, Icelandic is an example of an isolated language because it is so distinctly different from its original family. So um, it has changed less than any other language family um, and any other language in the Germanic branch. So there's also been a recently uh, discovered language in India that doesn't fit into a language group either. So now we're going to talk about some examples of these multilingual states and how they affect preserving language diversity. So Belgium is a really good example of um, the conflict that arises when different languages are put into one state. So in the north, you have uh, people who speak Flemish, which is a Dutch dialect, and in the south, you have people who speak French. And so there's been a struggle for power um, between these two distinct groups of people since the 1800s. And historically, uh, the, the Walloons living in Wallonia have dominated the economy and the politics. So by 1960, the, the state of Belgium was um, split in half, really. It was divided into two independent regions. Um, this was in the 1960s, and, and this is where we get this modern-day map. Um, so in the present, um, the, the Wallonia is, is not doing as well as Flanders. Um, there's about 14% unemployment there. So an example of conflict. Um, Quebec and uh, Canada being a multilingual state is also another example of conflict that I'm not going to talk about in this lecture because we talked about it in class. Um, but an example of how a multilingual state can be successful is Switzerland. Switzerland has four official languages, and these people have peacefully coexisted for years and years and years. And part of this is because um, there's a high degree of localized control um, instead of a federal system of control. And what I'd like to point out is that even though um, the Ro Romanche people are only 1% of the population, the Swiss government recognizes them as an official distinct language. Nigeria is another example that was discussed in your reading 6.3, so I'm not going to go in depth here, um, but you do need to know that it is another example of how a multilingual state creates a lot of conflict between the people, um, and sometimes, uh, like such as this instance, um, English is adopted as the official language to kind of try to stop some of the conflict between the opposing language groups. So language diversity can be preserved in an attempt to create a monolingual state, but there is really no monolingual state in the world today. Um, governments can use things such as immigration laws where their people are forced to learn the official language of the country before they are allowed to migrate there, um, or education, so a specific language is taught in um, schools. Um, but an example that we've kind of touched on are language institutions and laws against using other languages. And so the Academy of France is that um, institution that determines how and whether words will be translated into French. Um, it's most oftentimes targeting uh, English words. So you can take a look up here at the um, silly words that are banned um, in French because they're considered too westernized. Um, things like email, hot dog, and hashtag. Um, and so there are also fines that can be given or laws against using other languages um, to preserve a language. So um, in France, at least 40% of music and TV has to be broadcast in French. Um, and in Quebec, um, if your business cannot operate in French, you are fined. So lastly, let's talk about the global dominance of English. So English is considered the global or the world lingua franca. Um, and this is a language used among speakers of different languages for the purpose of communication, trade, and commerce. And so if you are a pilot or an air traffic controller, no matter where you are in the world, you are required to speak in English at your job. Um, and so this is just a way to um, help people's interactions with each other. The lingua franca of East Africa is Swahili, and Southeast Asia is Mandarin. 
And a pidgin language is kind of like a very, very simplified version of that lingua franca. Um, and some examples are Spanglish and Cajun. Um, and then lastly, we have a Creole. Um, and this is a pidgin language that develops a more complex structure in vocabulary. And it is the native language of a group of people. So this is frequently developed in colonial settings where linguistic um, traditions of indigenous people and colonizers blend. And so Pigeon French actually became Haitian Creole, which is the official language in Haiti.